watching it. Our veteran CBS News correspondent David Dow, who's been uh, covering the uh, building and the flight of the Voyager since 1981, is with us at Edwards Air Force Base. David, what a beautiful scene that is as the Voyager makes its pass over the desert. Well, it is a beautiful scene. Those of us who were here nine days ago to watch it take off, uh, I'm sure I'm not alone in saying, wondered if we'd ever see this morning. It seemed almost impossible, the whole notion of flying around the world, uh, as they like to say, with one tank of gas and landing back here at Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, there are several thousand, thousands of people out here who uh, lined the highway in the middle of the night to uh, get into Edwards Air Force Base for a look at this happening. Uh, in some ways reminiscent of, uh, of some of the crowds that used to uh, turn out here for uh, shuttle landings, space shuttle landings. Certainly the same era of expectancy, Dan. David, this has been described as uh, one of the last great goals in aviation. I'd have to say, uh, frankly, that I've doubted that, but those who say it, it, it's the accomplishment of one of the last great goals, why do they say that? Well, certainly it's just on the surface. There is the adventure aspect of flying nonstop around the world without refueling of uh, doubling a, a world distance record, in effect. But beyond that, uh, those like Bert Rutan, the, the pilot's brother, who have devoted a lifetime to aviation design, uh, see this as uh, perhaps, if not throwing open doors, at least nudging them a little further open toward the development of very fuel-efficient, very long-range uh, aircraft. Uh, see potential cargo and, and military applications for aircraft built of the same kind of composite materials, very lightweight, com tough composite materials that Voyager is. So there, it's more than an adventure as they see it. And the Voyager is made of a super lightweight materials, fiberglass, Kevlar, and graphite. If you're asking what Kevlar is, it's the same kind of material that's used in the so-called space blankets, I think, David. Uh, while the Voyager is coming in for a landing, and the plan here, David, check me as we go along, uh, as I understand it, is Voyager makes this pass and then turns around and comes back for its landing. Correct? That is correct. Well, as uh, we watch the, uh, what some might call plum weird looking Voyager, make this pass over the desert and prepare for its landing, David Dow talked to uh, Specialist Lee Heron a few moments ago about the final hours of the flight, so let's take a listen to that as uh, we wait for the Voyager to make its, uh, its landing. We'll have that uh, David Dow interview with uh, Lee Heron shortly. These, frankly, these photographs are so beautiful over the desert, we decided we'd stick with him for a moment. You good chance to see the, the forward engine and the rear engine. The rear engine is the one they've used uh, for most of the time. What a wonderful sight. It's interesting, Dan, the, the rear engine, so, so, so much concentration was placed into keeping this plane light that the rear engine does not have a starter, much like your automobile does. This morning, when it had to be restarted, it was windmilled to restart. It is intended to, to be started that way. But that gives you some idea of the leanness of this aircraft. Uh, I remember one time talking to Dick Rutan, and he picked up a little pill bottle, and he held it up, and he said, if I can take that much weight off this airplane, the plane, that gives me enough fuel to fly as far as I can swim. <laughs> well, David, let's go now to your uh, interview just a short while ago with Specialist Lee Heron about the final hours of the flight. Uh, Lee, in these closing hours, you had, uh, you had a scare, I gather. What, what was the nature of that? Well, we had last night, uh, shortly after midnight, a sudden engine uh, shutdown caused by fuel starvation, and uh, we had about five minutes of flight without any engines at all. What, uh, what actually happened? Well, we unported or allowed a fuel pickup line to pick up a little air, and the air fed into the engine, and, and gasoline engines don't run well on air, so it gave us quite a scare. What was the, what was the correction? You say you were five minutes without engines. What, uh, how much altitude was lost? What was the fix that was uh, affected? Well, it occurred at somewhere around 8,500 feet, and the pilot in command radioed that he had lost the rear engine and was descending through 8,500. This is Dick Rutan. Yes, and uh, then Dick, uh, one minute later approximately, uh, radioed that he was descending through 8,000, and then uh, approximately another minute through 7,500, and at that time we asked him if he had fire or fuel, and uh, without responding too much, uh, we had to come back and say, well, light up the front one. 
engines. And he fired up the front engine, which I'm sure he was doing before we said anything, and uh, was off and flying with both engines, and they're still on. How much of a, uh, at his darkest, at the darkest moment in this uh, episode, how, how much of a danger was there to, to the loss of the mission? Oh, it was, uh, it was about as hairy as you can get. And his wingman, Mike Melville, which was handling the radios, made the statement after we recovered uh, that he had tooth marks on his heart. Is there anything in this that, uh, just briefly, anything in this that could affect the landing here? No, nothing at all. We're back on two engines, which is what we plan to do to land the airplane. I am going to be out in the air, on the uh, lake bed and put him down as safe as we can in front of you, and uh, let's hope for the best. Lee Heron, thanks very much. Thank you, David. David Dow, uh, with that interview about the uh, final hours of Voyager. And we know that there are school children all over the country uh, watching some of this coverage of Voyager come in. And for those of you at home who want to play the game, let's quickly play a little game. Who was the first person to circumnavigate the globe by sea? Mine in the history of humankind, it hasn't been that long ago that man was still trying to make it around the globe by water. Sure, you know the answer, Ferdinand Magellan, 1519 to 1522. Right, took him from 1519 to 1522 to uh, make it around the world by sea. So far as you know, the first person to circumnavigate the globe and who and when was the first successful around the world flight? In the history of humankind, the history of flight is barely a fleck, just less than a century old. Well, the first successful round the world flight, remember it wasn't non-stop, and it certainly wasn't non-stop without refueling, was accomplished by Douglas DWC, Douglas World Cruiser, between the 6th of April and the 28th of September, 1924. Major Frederick Martin was the flight commander. So it wasn't in 1924 that man was able to fly around the world at all. We're not talking non-stop, and we're not talking about uh, setting any records for flying around without refueling. But David Dow at Edwards Air Force Base in California, this mission has been a wing and a prayer mission since it began. We said last night that they were out there on sort of a wing and a dream, weren't they? Well, I suppose it was a wing and a dream. It's a it's a dream band that began uh, uh, many years ago in in uh, what uh, in many ways would be a, a very unorthodox way. Uh, earlier, we took a look at the, that whole dream and it's uh, how it came to fruition. In appearance, it has been compared to birds. What a strange sensation it must be of flying all over around the world in such a small compartment as. Uh, these two have, Dick Rutan and Gina Yeager. Next time somebody asks you, where have all the heroes gone? We, you could say, well, I saw some the other morning over that desert at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Because whatever else you may or may not think about uh, this flight and whether it's been over-publicized, over-covered, hyped up, uh, it took a lot of courage, took a lot of guts, uh, and a lot of determination to make this flight. Dick Rutan is no stranger to courage. He was a combat pilot in Vietnam and flew 325 combat missions in Vietnam. He was shot down on his last flight, picked up in the China Sea. Co-pilot Gina Yeager, 34, is uh, single, no children, is no relation to test pilot Chuck Yeager, the famed engineer and uh, pilot who broke the sound barrier. These pictures live over the Edwards Air Force Base. Yes, David Dow. Yeah, uh, Dick Rutan has just uh, brought the Voyager over the crowd in what uh, might be characterized as a victory lap. And uh, there were cheers as it flew overboard, or flew overhead, rather. Uh, uh, the, the Voyager is now uh, in a uh, sweeping left turn, uh, turning back uh, to the, uh, the east here, apparently preparing uh, finally to come in for its landing here at Edwards Air Force Base. Now flying by a, a, a beautiful layer of clouds uh, way off to the south, the southeast. David, you mentioned earlier, and those who have followed the space program know that, ironically, and I, we should say with a note of sadness, that uh, amid the mostly blue skies landing today, 
that pilots Gina Yeager and Dick Rutan will be touching down on the desert runway that's been designated for the grounded, now grounded space shuttle uh, to land. That is correct. And an and awful lot of aviation history has been made at that Edwards Air Force Base. A lot of tests, a lot of experimental aircrafts over the years. Of course, you mentioned uh, Chuck Yeager a moment ago. Uh, most of Chuck Yeager's feats, and there were many, were right here at Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, uh, actually, just uh, uh, many of them launched just a few miles from where we're sitting right here. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a place of, of aviation first, aviation history, as you say. Uh, I can't help thinking, uh, you mentioned the space shuttle landings, what a contrast in some ways this landing will be to the shuttle in terms of at least the mechanics of it. I remember almost uh, as a cliche, we used to describe the steepness of the descent of the, the shuttles. This will be a very shallow, slow, gradual descent. Uh, in effect, uh, Rutan will almost have to fight this, this very high lift glider-like aircraft into the ground to make it land. And David, when we talk about uh, the sadness, and, and there is some about the, quite a bit, about the space shuttle being grounded, no one doubts we'll be up there and back there out into space again fairly soon. Nobody doubts it. This is a space oh, voyaging of, nation. Least of all, Dan, the people here, you can't help noticing it's so conspicuous, just a few hundred yards from where I'm sitting is the 747 piggyback plane, which used to uh, carry shuttles after they uh, landed here back to uh, the Cape to be refitted, to be uh, re-prepared, re prepared for uh, uh, additional flights. So it's all in place here uh, whenever it gets going again. Live pictures of the Voyager about to land in California on the desert airstrip that is Edwards Air Force Base after a world record, non-stop, around the world flight without refueling. First time in history that that has occurred. David, it's a reminder that America's place in history, you say, well, two, three, four thousand years from now and somebody starts considering what the country was about, particularly in the early centuries, I suppose they'll, uh, among the things they'll say, well, it's a space voyaging nation. Uh, it led in flight, manned flight, even before going into space. Our roadway system will be a marvel. Maybe the telephone system. Anything else come to mind? Well, one of the things the... One of the things that the, the Voyager people would quickly point out to you is, yes, you're exactly right, and one of the marvels will be that, uh, if they look at the Voyager, uh, is that it was carried off without any government funds, that it was not a product of a government program. In effect, it was, it was, uh, uh, it was launched with, uh, uh, with a, uh, uh, a few dollars and uh, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of hope and a lot of dreams. Uh, financed in the end by corporate sponsors, uh, public contributions, and the sales of uh, admittedly overpriced t-shirts. <laughs> well, David, we had mentioned earlier the first uh, around-the-world circumnavigation of the globe by Magellan, the uh, first around-the-world non-stop uh, airplane flight was that B-50 Superfortress uh, in 1949. Wiley Post made the first solo flight around the world in that Lockheed Vega monoplane out of Oklahoma called the Winnie Mae. That took off from Bennett Field here in New York. All of these things are, uh, you know, I'm sure, daring, almost inconceivable things uh, in, in their time. While we've been talking, Dan, the, uh, the Voyager has made a, an, another pass uh, another uh, orbit of, the, of uh, Edwards Air Force Base. It, it makes me, uh, it makes me wonder if the pilot's brother uh, was was being maybe half serious when he said that he hoped, expected indeed, to arrive back here at Edwards with enough fuel to uh, to arrive and orbit the field for three or four days. We've now had uh, two, in effect, victory orbits here. The closest call for this flight uh, from beginning to end were what, David? They had one close call just as they took off in the Voyager. Well, it, for a moment, it looked like a close call. The Voyager that you see uh, in your television set uh, has a wingspan approximately two feet shorter than it did uh, when it started its takeoff roll. It, it, in effect, ground off part of its wingtips, and before launching off on its uh, uh, odyssey around the world, it uh, uh, did a maneuver 
uh, to uh, knock off what they call the winglets, little vertical stabilizers at the ends of each wings. That, in effect, knocked off a foot off the end of each, uh, each wing. That was, uh, that was uh, travail number one. Uh, several times during the course of this, they have through, flown through uh, extreme turbulence, been knocked about. We've been told that uh, Gina Yeager uh, has been uh, battered and bruised and, uh, in effect, beat up as the plane has been uh, tossed about by, by storms and turbulence. Uh, we should point out that the, uh, uh, that the uh, compartment behind the cockpit where the person who is not flying uh, lies, there's no room to stand up, obviously, does not have the, uh, the normal uh, heavyweight restraints that, for instance, a, a military helicopter or any other aircraft would have. So they've been very vulnerable to being battered about in that cockpit. David, I can't remember anyone being cooped up in such a small space for such a long time on any experiment like this uh, ever. Does anything come to mind that even approaches it? Well, certainly some of the early, the very early uh, uh, space missions involved people being cooped up. I can't remember any of them that went this long cooped up in this tight an area. Certainly uh, no two people being too, cooped no up. No two people, that's, that's correct. Uh, it certainly rivals uh, anything that the uh, uh, space program inflicted on its uh, astronaut crews. And now the landing gear goes down on the Voyager. Great front shot, or at least one of the landing gears down. Now, could that be trouble, David? There's no, if it does, there's no indication that it does. Well, clearly it's not designed strange and weird as it is. It isn't designed to have, to land on one landing gear. Let's look and see if the other landing gear drops. The left main looks to us like it's down and locked. Dick, have you got a green light? Yeah, We're waiting for the uh, the other looks like the other gear to come down. Two miles, average tower. They are separate systems. The left gear is free. Outstanding, yeah, we confirm that. Now this shot from below shows you both of the engines are turning now, the front and rear engine. Two miles, uh, the Edward. I really like your little main gear motor, Nick. Yeah, I think you did. We now have the rear gear. Well, I'll tell you what, Dick, you can say that again a hundred times. I concur. That's the team effort all the way. That's even the your pilot, right? And they're talking about pilot Dick Rutan. They were just saying he's one hell of a pilot, and to that, everyone can say amen. Anybody who flies 325 combat missions and makes this historic flight, uh, at the very least, deserves that accolade. So far as we know, uh, no difficulty developing with the other landing gear. Uh, as David Dow points out, there are separate systems on these landing gear, and so you have one landing gear down, the other not yet down, and to repeat for emphasis, so far as we know, it doesn't indicate trouble because the other landing gear is not down yet. Any indication why that gear is not down? The chase planes surround the Voyager. Hmm? Everything okay, seems in order for the landing. Position now, anytime you want to uh, turn your little motor on and bring the right gear down, we'll be waiting. So clearly they're, they're about to lower it. Instructions from the ground okay. to try to bring the right gear down. Also, Dick, I have a little bone to fix it with you. Uh, after the scare you gave me this morning, I've got gray hairs all over my head. Oh. Yeah, this one is particularly gentle because... Uh, come down very even because it has an official NAA gear counter on it to ensure that the airplane did not land. Some other place for the plane. The, uh, and that little counter has the to work. The compartment for the other landing gear is open to the right, trying to get it down. Uh, you didn't think landing on some aircraft carrier, did you? Uh, with David no. Dow, is there any indication that they're having any difficulty with that other landing gear, or is this yeah, standard procedure? The right main gear door is open. The right mirror, uh, rear, the right main yeah, rear door is open. We are trying to get it down now. We are not given any indication that there is a difficulty. However, there it comes down now. Orbit. You can see the landing gear beginning to come down now in just the right-hand corner of the frame of the picture. Well, for at least those of us who are uninitiated in these things, that was a bit of a breath-holding moment. Yeah, now both of the landing gear are down in place. 
you could see that second gear, the right-hand gear, come down. So now all seems to be in order for Voyager. As you can see, is it from this shot, both the landing gear down. You see how thin, how frail it is. One is reminded of that old sailor's admonition of how unforgiving the sea is, and the aviators come back. Yes, the sea is unforgiving, but the air is even more unforgiving. And to fly this fragile contraption around the world nonstop without refueling, dodging typhoons over the Pacific, among other things, we're reminded of just how unforgiving the air can be and how dangerous it can be up there, even with the latest technology. Some of which is represented by this aircraft. We're now waiting, Dan, for the nose gear to come down. Historic flight around the world, non-stop without refueling, doubling the previous world record, which was set by a B-52 bomber. Dan Rather with in New York with David Dow at Edwards Air Force Base in the Mojave Desert in California. The landing gear is down, the tricycle landing gear, and this ultra-light two-engine but minimally powered sort of flying fuel tank with pilot Dick Rutan and co-pilot Gina Yeager aboard is uh, circling the long, easy-to-land-on airstrip at Edwards Air Force Base and coming in for its landing. Dan, at this stage, we are just seconds short of precisely nine days since Voyager took off uh, here at Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, another airfield a few miles from this one, but uh, here at the same Air, Air Force Base. Get the picture, if you will. These two people, Dick Rutan and Gina Yeager, have been cooped up in the cockpit, if you want to call it that, something about the size of your average telephone booth for more than 200 hours nine days. David, do we know if it took along any reading material? <laughs> they, if they did, they probably didn't have time to, uh, to read it. Most of the time we were being told that they were extremely busy uh, keeping data, reporting data. Often communications became very labored, where, where uh, instructions had to be repeated three and four times where numbers had to be repeated to uh, mission control at uh, here at uh, nearby here at Mojave, uh, California, several times. Uh, there was just an awful lot. When Amelia Earhart was to fly solo across the Atlantic, she did that in 1932. But the first woman to fly around the world was Jerry Mock in 1964. We're talking about flying the, around the world solo. Dan. Yes. Uh, Voyager is now on final approach here on the uh, lake bed, coming in uh, toward its landing, a chase plane just above and ahead of it. All the gear down. Low and slow. And touchdown. The Voyager is on the ground. Nine days after it took off, and it has established a new world record for around the world flight without refueling. A big cheer here, Dan, as, uh, as it touches down and, and, and rolls out in contrast to its uh, takeoff. Roll out is a, is a matter of a, a, a few hundred feet, maybe a little over a thousand feet. It took 14,000 feet of runway to get off, loaded down with three and a half tons of fuel. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a different airplane in some ways that we see landing here. David, that's a good point. When it 